Welcome everyone. My name is Maggie Conglin and I'm a member of the Kellogg Alumni Relations team. Before we get started in a few moments, we wanted to let you know that all attendees will be muted throughout the program. However, we encourage you to participate by asking questions at any time via the Q&A icon that's located at the bottom of your screen. Today's program will last about 60 minutes. Dean Cornelli and Vanita Gupta will have a conversation and address audience questions throughout the program. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on Kellogg's YouTube channel next week. On behalf of the Kellogg School of Management, thank you again for joining us today. With that, I will turn it over to Dean Cornelli to get us started. Welcome uh, to everybody uh, to uh, our uh, Distinguished Alumni Series. I have to say this has uh, quickly become the highlight of my uh, week as I had the pleasure, I have the pleasure to interview our amazing alumni and be so proud uh, to be part of this amazing uh, community. And today I'm really delighted to uh, welcome another amazing alumna, uh, Vinita Gupta. Uh, Vinita is uh, the CEO of Lupin, the multinational pharmaceutical firm uh, based in uh, India. It produces more than, uh, although she's based in uh, sunny Naples, uh, I can see. Uh, Lupina produces more than 180 affordable generic medication. This is the third largest uh, pharmaceutical company in the US in prescriptions uh, dispensed. And uh, she's been really instrumental in, tra in transforming Lupin into a global uh, powerhouse. And she's been regular named in uh, Forbes Asia's list of uh, Top 50 power business women. Uh, she's also a Kellogg Global Advisory Board. So she is a very uh, strong supporter of Kellogg and I'm very grateful for that. And uh, when I met her, she told me how she, she is possibly one of the, if not the very youngest, one of the youngest MBA at, uh, at Kellogg and she, went personally to convince uh, Don Jacobs, the dean at the time, uh, to admit her, right, and, uh, despite so young, and she accepted. So, and clearly she was right, <laughs> because she's been incredibly successful. And I should also um, mention, like uh, I was just telling her what an uh, incredibly talented family they are. They are all incredibly successful, but I should mention, her sister, who is the COO of a Rush Hospital here in Chicago and the head of the COVID-19 command and the unit, and uh, therefore the person who designed and executed an amazing plan for the pandemics and saved uh, lots of lives. So that's, uh, so you know, welcome Vinita and thank you. And we are so proud to uh, have you here. Thank you, Francesca. I'm very pleased to be here and meet uh, you as well as the Kellogg community. So uh, we are, uh, there's a lot of people who I'm sure are, are really, uh, you know, eager to hear. So let me start with uh, one uh, general question about you. Like you spent more than two decades, right? Create, you know, forging your path in uh, uh, in Lupin who was founded in 1968 by your uh, father. Now, how, how can you describe your career, your path, and how can someone navigate a multinational family firm? Sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very exciting. It's very exciting, especially uh, uh, my experience was uh, uh, very rewarding and uh, exciting, uh, Francesca. But, uh, you know, for me, it was not uh, um, um, only a career path. It was really my dream to take uh, Lupin Global that shaped my journey in the company. You know, since I was a kid, I watched my father build the company with tremendous amount of passion and a wonderful purpose to meet areas of unmet need. In the early days, uh, he started with a focus on tuberculosis, which was a big problem in India. And um, as I saw him build the company, I wanted to really put Lupin on the global map, be part of taking the company global. So when I joined Lupin, I was given the opportunity uh, and the challenge to find a way to um, 
um, get Lupin into the developed markets, in particular the US as well as Europe. Um, until then, Lupin had a direct presence only in India and exported um, active pharmaceutical ingredients into um, other countries, but primarily emerging markets. So it was not quite a multinational when I joined. It was primarily India-based uh, with, with exports. So my first job in the company was in business development. And I started looking at ways and means to gain access uh, to the markets, uh, you know, uh, the US and, and Europe in particular for our products through partners. The first three years, I established multiple partnerships for the company to get our products into, um, uh, into each country. And it was a wonderful way to get to know the industry um, as well as uh, the key players. Um, so soon after we entered the US and European markets, I realized how important it was to control your own destiny and uh, be direct uh, into the market. Um, so we decided uh, that we're gonna find a way to establish a direct presence in uh, a few countries, the US being the largest. So I moved to the US at that point um, and I started with uh, three people in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, um, you know, in 2001, 2002 and started building our uh, US operations and uh, was fortunate, um, was able to build it uh, to over a billion dollar business uh, organically with uh, um, very strong collaboration um, um, between the US as well as India, making sure we get right products from India into the US as well as um, uh, bringing some strong talent into the US to help me um, achieve that uh, goal. So today Lupin is uh, the third largest company by prescriptions dispensed in the US. Um, and it was a wonderful journey to really build it from scratch. So in uh, 2013, I was elevated to the CEO position and um, have had the opportunity to work on really expanding the geographic footprint of the company further through multiple acquisitions uh, we did uh, 15 acquisitions in um, a, a period of five years to be able to get into all of the countries that uh, uh, we wanted to uh, be in long term, uh, as well as um, you know starting to build uh, new growth drivers for the company. So the last five years has been again navigating uh, the next phase of growth, uh, you know building new growth drivers for the organization that uh, we're just at the cusp of uh, bringing to market now. So it's been a tremendous journey. That sounds actually really exciting. So, you know, it, it's very interesting because you're, you're talking about a family business, which is something at Kellogg we study a lot. And now also we are in, in the middle of a crisis and also at Kellogg, we really like to, you know, we teach, we proud ourselves our teaching on crisis management. So I wanted to ask you about, about the two, right? I mean. Are there any advantages to navigate a crisis, especially one like the present one, with a family business? How, what was your experience? Or are there also disadvantages? What, what's been your experience? Yeah, so um, uh, they're both advantages as well as disadvantages. I mean, the big advantage uh, is um, uh, for us in particular, um, you know, we were relevant to the crisis, being a pharmaceutical company, um, we intrinsically, you know, had the position to, to weather the storm. So that was a great start for, for us already. I mean, uh, as a family-owned business, a family-run business, because Lupin is really a listed company with a large family presence, large family ownership uh, now, uh, we created a culture in the organization where um, um, our, uh, uh, our um, uh, you know, team felt very much part of the organization. You know, my... So, so one of the areas that uh, was uh, that I focused very hard was very important to my father, that Lupin should be an organization where uh, family work like professionals and professionals feel like family. And we really created that kind of sense of ownership where people really, you didn't have to ask them, they uh, knew they had to step up really to respond to the crisis. So um, that certainly helped us tremendously to respond very rapidly in a very agile and very nimble manner 
um, right from the onset of the crisis uh, to this day, as we try to bring our um, uh, people back to the workplace uh, safely. I mean, um, um, so I think uh, there are definitely more advantages than disadvantages, but uh, the downside is, uh, is stress. You know, during the crisis, you are stretched and you are stressed. And uh, when you are the helm of your family company, in many ways, your family legacy, the stress is just amplified, you know? So finding ways to manage through the stress while ensuring a viable path ahead is crucial. And for me, having clarity on our path through the crisis, taking timely actions and clearly communicating where we are was a big part of managing the stress. I always want to know where we're going. What is, what is the direction and what is the end point? What is the uh, goal point uh, for us? And then communicate it to the rest of the team. And that, that became a very important part of the crisis management as well as stress management, uh, both. And so we took communication to a different level so that all stakeholders knew where we stood. No one was surprised. The last thing you want in a crisis is a lack of communication. We came up with multiple forums to ensure effective communication, at some points even over communicating, you know, but you can never communi communicate enough in a crisis. Um, and I think that really went a long way to help us do the right thing, right thing through the crisis and uh, make sure that uh, we come out of it stronger as an organization. I mean, on the personal front, uh, uh, you know, again, stress is, uh, you know, dealing with stress was a real downside. And, um, but uh, the time with the family during the lockdown and discovering some of my rusty skills, like cooking in the absence of house help, <laughs> was a great stress buster, you know, as well through the crisis. I used my Peloton more than ever <laughs> through the lockdown. So, so multiple, um, you know, tools for stress management, both uh, at work as well as home. That's very interesting because exactly also we did webinars and so on. And it's like, it's, we try to help with business, but also exactly, you, you need to have a holistic approach, uh, also personal during the crisis to survive the stress of a business, as you were saying, right? Very it's much so. I mean, it was very easy to get caught up. Um, we were, you know, as soon as the crisis started and we went to work from home, our calendars just got filled up and suddenly you don't have any any downtime you know because everyone's available yes. and everyone expects you to be available you know um, everyone's doing uh, you know uh, uh, more than they, they did to their job so it's you know the, the balance between um, 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 you know uh, your business priorities personal priorities and also doing some fun at work um, you know, and our, our team did wonderful things, uh, like, uh, you know, in, in different parts of the world. In India, for example, uh, we had a contest for physicians who were all sitting at home. They couldn't go to, uh, you know, their, uh, their offices and practice. Uh, some of them are very talented, and we came up with a, uh, with a you know, music vocal contest that uh, I finally was, you know, was honored to, to be able to judge uh, the the finalists from the 3,000 people that uh, uh, participated. So, so we tried to really uh, bring in a, a number of um, different interventions to enrich, um, uh, you know, our people while they were at home, um, while still making progress, um, you know, um, and ensuring business continuity, as well as, uh, uh, you know, balancing the family. Yes. That's very interesting. I'm seeing a lot of questions coming up for the, on the pharmaceutical industry, but let me ask you a couple of questions more about the, this crisis, uh, if you want, because it were very interesting. So has uh, Lupin got involved either directly or indirectly in the development or production of any COVID-related product? How did you so right from the beginning, uh, Francesca, we decided, uh, we established a, a dual mission for Lupin. One was to keep our, our employees safe. That was number one. And two was to join the fight in whatever, whichever way we could. So first thing we did was uh, look at uh, our current portfolio. What do we have that is relevant um, for COVID? And we realized, uh, you know, as a company that has a legacy in um, anti-infectives, in antimicrobials, as well as uh, upper respiratory tract uh, products. We had a number of products in our portfolio that were very relevant. 
We had products like azithromycin, where we are the largest uh, producer, largest supplier of the product in the US. We had hydroxychloroquine, which uh, came under a lot of, uh, uh, came under a, lot of, a big cloud, but uh, it is yet to be seen. I was this morning talking to our team in India and they were telling me how widely hydroxychloroquine is being used as a prophylactic for, you know, uh, of course it has to be approved by the agency in different countries, but uh, there are countries that, uh, um, you know, are currently using the product. Third, we had a product albuterol that for respiratory distress that was, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, being used and the, the, the demand really ramped up. So the first thing we did was, let's take a look at the current portfolio. Um, what are the needs within the current portfolio and make sure that we can meet the demand, you know? Uh, make sure that we can keep our facilities running, uh, make sure that we can get uh, uh, our manufacturing staff into the facilities in a safe manner, and uh, make sure that we uh, continue to supply. Um, and we found that uh, the demand for some of the drugs, in particular azithromycin, ramped up significantly. So, um, you know, it um, 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 got us... Uh, uh, our team on the supply chain um, to the drawing board to figure out how we're going to meet this demand. What can we do uh, to really uh, make sure that we can um, bring these essential medicines um, uh, to patients that, that need it? And within a matter of, uh, I'd say, uh, days or maybe at the most couple of weeks, our team found a way to triple the, the production during lockdowns. At wow. Yeah, yeah, it was through, you know, at various sites. Um, uh, I don't know if you recall, but uh, um, uh, somewhere uh, through the last three months, we also had a situation where the countries became very, um, um, you know, um, they, want, they, they started to, uh, to uh, uh, lock down the trade uh, uh, relationships between, uh, uh, you know, uh, countries so that they can make sure that drugs are available for uh, their own people. So India locked down, um, um, you know, supply or uh, 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 export of medicines like um, um, hydroxychloroquine, which at that time was uh, uh, considered crucial. Uh, likewise, many other countries did. So within that uh, kind of disruption in uh, 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 trade, we started looking at how can we build flexibility within a supply chain and uh, look to leverage our facilities in the U.S. We have a facility in New Jersey. We have a facility in, in Florida. Um, started looking at tech transferring products between India and uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, got uh, um, a blessing from the FDA to um, you know, so work very closely with the regulatory agencies to ensure that uh, we can uh, expedite uh, those products and uh, really have a flexible supply chain and made it happen. So, you know, we uh, did a lot of, um, um, you know, really looking at what can we do with what we have and uh, made sure that we continue to uh, meet the demand um, in the market uh, despite challenges in the lockdown and the Lockdown, even the where our facilities are, was a a big big challenge that uh, we had to overcome, and um, uh, logistics was another challenge. You know, for uh, a good period of time, uh, ocean shipment uh, was shut. Uh, you only had air shipment. Also, air travel was under strain, so the cost of uh, uh, transportation went up five times. Um, so, wow. yeah, there were times that uh, uh, you know we didn't make. Uh, any, any margin on our product, uh, but we said we have to make it available for the patients. And so that was, that's what, that was what we did with our current portfolio. And then we decided that we will uh, track very closely all the products that are in development and anything that looks promising, we will start to get involved. Given our, again, history in um, um, anti-infectives, antivirals and uh, capabilities in manufacturing, um, uh, active ingredients, uh, we can very quickly ramp up anything that we find is working. 
actually, you know, all, all these things that you're saying, and also the fact that you produce even a cost, like we, there's a question here, I want to link to one and I have here. The question here was saying, uh, how do you deal with the negative press that big pharma always gets in the US? But I want to link it with something I, I was also thinking, which is, well, maybe also that is changing because everybody is looking at pharma as our savior, right? So is the negative press before, but how you deal with that, but maybe also could it be changing the way people will look after this crisis of big pharma? Um. So, so negative uh, pricing uh, in, right. in the sorry, that was the question. How do you deal with a negative press that big pharma gets in the, the US? Press. Right, right. Um, um, you know, I, I think uh, this crisis has really shown the importance of our industry, you know, and the importance of innovation. I mean, um, you look at the number of uh, companies that have stepped up to uh, develop drugs, to develop uh, vaccines. And uh, we certainly hope that they're going to be successful in their efforts. That should uh, uh, really, uh, um, you know, be uh, uh, demonstrate the importance of our industry. And, and I think uh, that uh, the dialogue has changed a little bit in the last few months. Um, uh, we, we believe that uh, people have started to recognize the importance of our industry and what it does uh, you know um, it's very tough to hear uh, the uh, you know the talk on uh, uh, pricing and all the negative press around pricing and sometimes even as generic companies that really are part of the solution you know try to bring uh, affordable medicine sometimes we're just lumped in with uh, um, companies that um, raise you know cost of health care in in the country so it is it's it's really hard to see the industry with uh, in, in that limelight, but really the last uh, few months have been, um, uh, have showcased what the industry can do for uh, the public, uh, for public uh, good. And, and given that you, you, you raised the thing about innovation, right? How do you approach, uh, I mean, looking approaches the drug innovation? How do you decide what to pursue, what to postpone? Yeah. I'm thinking also the public good, right? Not only the, your business in a way. Yeah. So a big part of our business is generic drugs, which is affordable medicines. And the focus there is really to bring affordable versions of existing brands across multiple therapeutic areas. Um, and we have a broad presence in generics, uh, uh, in anti-infectives and cardiovasculars, CNS drugs, women's health products. To, to an extent, uh, you know, the generic side of the business is therapeutic area agnostic. It is more focused on technology platforms and capabilities and the ability to um, uh, bring a pipeline of products as patents expire to be able to, um, um, you know, um, bring affordable versions of branded products to market. So we have approached drug innovation uh, through two, um, in two uh, ways. One is building capabilities in specialty areas of unmet need. For example, we decided to focus on women's health in the US, um, an area where we felt a lot of the big pharma companies had uh, um, you know, gone, gone, gotten out of. So there was a real uh, uh, gap and there was not enough innovation. So we decided to focus on women's health and now have a business, uh, we have a team, we have a product in the market and we have multiple products in development. So it started with a focus in, uh, in a therapeutic area where uh, there's an unmet need. Likewise, um, in um, Europe, we decided to focus on neurology. Um, you know, we have an often uh, um, drug uh, neurology product on the market for a condition of high unmet need. Um, we're trying to bring this product also into the US market. So it's, uh, we, we really focused on specialty from the lens of where is, uh, where is it that, that you have an unmet need and how can Lupin serve it? Um, the second thing we did was we built a discovery uh, um, um, capability, a team with the focus on discovering first-in-class or best-in-class programs. 
And this was with a long-term vision for Lupin to bring its own molecules to market. You know, over the past 10 years, we have invested in uh, to a couple of areas and have been successful in developing and partnering two novel oncology programs that are potentially best in class. So, so that was the other way for us to get into innovation in the early stage discovery um, and uh, really try to be at the cutting edge from a, 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 a therapeutic area and a need standpoint to develop best in class programs. So with a lens of trying to really address unmet needs, we are, I believe we focus on the public good. I mean, from a business standpoint, of course, we try to stay disciplined on our investments and return criteria uh, to ensure that we are do doing the right thing uh, for all our stakeholders. But we have a few areas that we have focused on for, for public good specifically. I mean, we have a strong presence in tuberculosis products and an emerging presence in antivirals across the globe, in particular in the high burden countries like India, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America. And we have a vertically integrated position. So we manufacture the API, we manufacture the finished product so that we can try to bring access to affordable medicines in these therapeutic areas. Um, and uh, second, a focus and commitment uh, on the genetic front uh, through which we bring uh, access to affordable medicines um, it's, it's, you know, um, makes a material difference. Just in the US on an annual basis, we contribute $18 billion worth of savings to the healthcare system. So I believe we have a very balanced business that creates value and meets patient needs, healthcare needs, and makes a difference. That's very interesting. Now, I, I see two questions that got interested by, because you mentioned the acquisition. One said, you mentioned 15 acquisition in five years. How did you plan for that? And another related said, you mentioned that a lot of your growth was through acquisition. Can you comment on your process for identifying potential acquisition and your subsequent approach to acquiring those companies? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so there are multiple questions there. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's all about, you know, it's a clearly, you know, how, how, how did you accomplish and, uh, such yeah. an amazing growth through acquisition? Yes. So, um, uh, so I, I must say that the first uh, uh, part of a global expansion was really organic to really get to understand markets, get comfortable in particular with the US market, with large markets. Uh, um, and then once we got comfortable and we had the platform and the pipeline, we said now we can really leverage this pipeline globally if we had, um, you know, beachheads, if we had, front, you know, uh, a presence across multiple countries. So the way we approached our acquisitions was uh, we got very strategic with uh, um, you know, the countries where we wanted to be present in. So um, initially we were present in India and then the US through our, uh, you know, um, through our venture in the US. But um, uh, we started uh, first with the geographic, geographic expansion and got into Japan, made uh, two acquisitions in Japan. Um, um, so then we've gone to South Africa, uh, made a small acquisition there and then built it up uh, very well after that. Um, we got into Germany uh, through an acquisition. We uh, got into Latin America. We acquired an entity, an ophthalmics company in Mexico. We acquired a, a generics company in Brazil. Um, we acquired a company in um, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was really fun. It was a very fun phase of <laughs> really acquiring all these uh, companies across different countries in Australia. And then we made a couple of acquisitions in the US. Uh, we acquired products that uh, really helped us build our uh, specialty business. Uh, we acquired a women's health product a couple of years ago that is the anchor of our uh, specialty business in the US. Um, we um, acquired a company in New Jersey um, that uh, gave us uh, a very strong uh, R&D manufacturing base in the U.S., which is, uh, uh, was a very important part of a strategy to really have a, a global supply chain. Um, and uh, we, um, um, so it was a combination of geographic expansion, looking at where we wanted to enter from a geographic standpoint. Um, second was platform capabilities. Uh, like this, um, you know, um, acquisition in New Jersey was really more acquiring platforms 
And, um, um, you know, uh, likewise, we had a company in the Netherlands that we acquired uh, for um, injectable platform um, capability. So in all cases, very strategic. It was always, uh, what is a strategic uh, direction? A strategic direction was taking our generics um, routes and, uh, um, you know, uh, entering into the key markets that uh, we could make a difference through our pipeline. Second was evolving uh, generic capabilities into new platforms, so platform acquisitions. And third was building a, a innovation business, novel products business. Uh, that's where the specialty investments came in, um, in women's health as well as uh, in neurology. And in all of the acquisitions, we were very mindful, you know, so in most, in all of them, um, our approach was very much that we were acquiring the company for its capabilities, its strength, whether it is um, a, 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 a new ge geography or a new platform capability. So the last thing you want to do is come in and put your own systems, your, you know, integrate them, so to say, you know. Uh, we always took our time. We did not go in and uh, in the first day put the loop and banner up and <laughs> uh, second day really changed all the systems and processes. Uh, we took time to really learn the culture, learn what made an entity successful, identify how can we help with Lupin's capabilities, bring Lupin's strengths from a corporate perspective, from finance, from legal, from an HR perspective for sure, um, but uh, really keep an entity, um, you know, um, nurture it <laughs> to really be able to get, uh, you know, to really build on the value that they have. So for many, many years, we kept uh, the names of the entities that uh, we acquired a company in South Africa is known as Pharma Dynamic, a company in Germany is known as Hormason, in um, Brazil is Lab Grin. And all of them over time, once they said, oh, we want to be part of the Lupin umbrella. So we um, have the Lupin umbrella, it's called a Lupin Group Company, but we continue to have the, the local presence, the uh, local nuance. That's very interesting. Would you say that uh, being, as you were saying, as a family business, that uh, you have a special culture, maybe particularly respectful of the fact that each entity had to you wanted to respect them as a separate, you know, with their own culture and let them have their time? So uh, it was definitely part of the culture. Our culture is a very high on respect and care in the organization. Uh, but it was also, um, we were not really acquiring entities to find synergies from a cost perspective. Our goal was not scale. You know, our goal was scale eventually, but it was not taking our existing business, buying a similar business and uh, finding synergies. It was always adding value, I adding to, uh, you know, really making, really fitting our strategy and strategic uh, uh, needs as of the organization. And therefore there was a need to really preserve what we buy. Absolutely, I understand. Uh, now, one more, qu another question here says, uh, it says, hi, Vinita, thanks for sharing your experience at Lupin. I'm curious, what are the main differences in running a pharmaceutical company in developed markets, such as the US, and developing markets such as India? Wow, <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. It, it is a, a, a completely different markets, completely different dynamics. Um, you know, just if you look at... Uh, um, the, the industry in India, uh, it is uh, really um, all about uh, branded generics. Uh, it's all about uh, um, uh, brand loyalty that you create with the physicians. Uh, while in the US, in the developed market, it is um, um, all about uh, the pipeline you can bring into the generic market. At least for us, um, in the beginning, it was very much about bringing um, a generic pipeline into the market and uh, what was important was R&D, pipeline, uh, manufacturing capabilities, GMP, um, you know, capabilities from a quality perspective, uh, supply chain strengths. Um, so a lot of what we do in India actually uh, is for the US market. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the Indian market per se, 
um, is, uh, uh, is, is very unique in its, uh, um, and has its own dynamics and uh, requires a very, you know, um, different uh, uh, strengths and capabilities, which is more in brand building. So more um, marketing and brand building. At the end of the day though, when I think about it for both places, it's about people, you know, and making sure that um, you get the right people with the right capabilities in, in the two regions. But they're very, very different. And, uh, um, you know, uh, to an extent, um, uh, really with very little synergy. They're fairly distinct as businesses. And there's a related, slightly related question. It says, can you discuss some of the challenges you have faced leading an India-based company from the United States? How has this changed as the economy becomes increasingly more global? I would say you have many countries more than the India, but has this... Yeah. Um, so the, the challenges have been really um, uh, one, you have to communicate even more. You know, so they're getting very used to calls at crazy hours. Uh, <laughs> my calendar, you know, first thing in the morning is always packed uh, with calls, um, you know, with India. Um, and, uh, you know, a big part of it is really communication, um, you know, and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, given so much of our business is connected, the seamless integration from uh, the manufacturing plant in India to the customer interface in the U.S. is crucial. So, um, you know, I, I felt like my job has, has, has always been to create that platform where people come together, you know, make sure that we create more forums where we can really um, get alignment of what we are trying to achieve and make sure that people work hand in hand to achieve that uh, objective. Um, I, I think uh, apart from um, the internal challenges, there are external challenges, you know, from a stakeholder standpoint, um, um, you know, um, um, managing uh, um, our, our shareholders and, um, you know, so I travel to India quite often, uh, got very used to that 15 hour flight, uh, uh, nonstop flight uh, to India. Actually, this has been the first time in, I don't know, 10 plus years that I haven't traveled to um, India in three months, but otherwise I'm always there every other month. Um, but uh, to me, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, business is all about uh, having a vision and having a purpose, a mission, and aligning the team anywhere in the globe to that purpose and mission. And it's a lot about um, you know, making sure that you have the right forums to um, to engage the team, to build that buy-in, and uh, uh, and then track and monitor the progress, and uh, um, you know, uh, make sure that uh, things are moving in the right direction. Yes, that's. I'm, I'm, I'm getting so many questions. You're clearly inspiring uh, everybody. I have another one that says, could you share some effective steps that you took to professionalize uh, Lupin as a family business? What would you recommend to folks entering similar situations? Um, so so um, we worked very hard to make sure that we can attract the best, best talent in Lupin. You know, and uh, I think I might have mentioned earlier that uh, it was very important for my father, for Lupin to be an organization where uh, uh, family work like professionals and professionals feel like family. So, uh, you know, um, we were, we always demonstrated as family that uh, uh, we, we have to be held accountable. I, I always, um, you know, um, as, as I built my, um, um, you know, career, so to say, in Lupin, it was always about earning my right, earning my position. Um, and, and that is important so that professionals also know that uh, the company is a merito meritocracy. And, um, you know, um, uh, if they do the right thing for the organization, if uh, they have the ability to take the organization to the right level, they have the opportunity to do so. So it was very much about really uh, uh, creating a culture where uh, people knew that they can grow in the organization uh, to any level in the organization. 
and uh, you know fostering that uh, feeling of family in the professionals and uh, demonstrating as a professional I as a family a member I've worked like a professional it's one and the same um, and and then building a culture of trust empowerment um, while holding people accountable you know I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who are paying a lot of attentions to that. I have now another couple of questions. There's a lot of people who are clearly interested in pharmaceutical industry and want to know more about the future of Lupin. One says, Lupin has been making big strides in the biosimilars space. Where do you think future potential and growth lies for Lupin? And I'll read you another one also because I have so many questions. What challenges do you see in the future with intense competition in generic in US market given the pressure from bulk purchases by big wholesaler and not for profit company like Civica? I mean, these are big questions, but if you want, the question is where do you see Lupin, the future, right? Sorry, I'm bound because I can see my, the number of my question growing exponentially. You're clearly raising a lot of questions by people, yes. So, uh, I, I feel like I'm really blessed and fortunate. We at Lupin are very blessed. We have multiple growth drivers in the organization. I will start with the biosimilars. Um, as the first question was biosimilars, it's an area that we've, we've been investing in for the last many years and um, have uh, recently uh, been able to really get uh, to, uh, to, to a point of validation of our capabilities. So we really look at uh, biosimilars as the future of the generic industry. If you look at the generic industry and look at uh, the products going off patent over the next 10 years, more and more, more products going off patent are biologics. So for companies to really participate in the generic industry long-term, you're gonna to have to be a biologics, a biosimilars player. And that is the vision with which we decided to build biosimilars capabilities, biologics capabilities. We said, there's gonna be a time when um, it's gonna be important to bring uh, uh, affordable versions of biologics to market and loop enough to start building the, the capabilities now. So we have, a, a few uh, products in development right now, um, a couple of oncology products, uh, rheumatoid arthritis product, uh, a couple of ophthalmic products, and uh, got our first product approved uh, actually last week in, in, in Europe, which was a, a, a great validation um, um, uh, for our team. And uh, right now are building the go-to-market uh, plan for the US, so it's a very exciting time for our US uh, generics as well as um, institutional uh, team trying to navigate uh, you know, and uh, um, create the business plan for our biosimilars in the US. Um, in other markets, we decided to partner. We decided that uh, you know, biosimilars right, right now, since the market is still evolving, they are really, uh, um, um, uh, they, uh, it's a hybrid uh, commercial um, effort you know, uh, much like branded in some countries, in some countries it is uh, more efficient. So um, um, in countries like US, we decided to go direct. In other countries, we decided to partner with companies that have the capabilities to promote our products to be able to um, build a uh, um, uh, share effectively. So very excited about biosimilars. And as I mentioned, I see it as a future of generics. Um, certainly, we as Lupin are very well positioned to um, uh, build uh, that as a material growth driver for our organization. As far as pressure on the generic side of the business goes, uh, yes, we have no dearth of <laughs> pressure <laughs> on the generic side of the business, especially with the customer consolidation. In the last couple of years, uh, we saw our margins uh, um, uh, under pressure. And two years ago, actually, our margins came to the rock bottom. And for the whole industry, uh, ourselves as well as um, um, as the, the question uh, suggested, um, you know, um, um, there there are many of us. Uh, the manufacturer end of our industry is very fragmented, and um, the customer side uh, is very consolidated. Over the last five years, uh, our buyers have gone from being uh, uh, ten to ninety percent of the market is. Uh, is uh, uh, with three, controlled by three. So it's a very, very consolidated market, which um, you know, obviously puts 
pressures on margins, pressures on pricing. And what we've done as a company to stay ahead of the curve is um, ensure that we are investing into platforms and uh, pipeline um, ahead of the curve. So the oral solid dosage forms are, uh, you know, are now a mature part of the generic industry. Um, you know, there are opportunities on the oral solid dosage form, but for a generic company like ourselves to grow on a consistent basis, we had to access other platforms. So f six years ago, we built capabilities in inhalation products to do meter dose de um, inhalers and uh, dry powder inhalers devices. So in Coral Springs in Florida, we established a facility to um, um, develop uh, MDIs and DPIs, have filed multiple products, one of which is very relevant uh, through the COVID crisis that we're hoping to get approval for any day now. Um, you know, um, likewise, we built capabilities in injectables. We acquired this company in Netherlands to gain access to uh, depot injectable uh, uh, platform capabilities. Um, and no one has uh, really uh, uh, cracked that challenge as of yet. Uh, we hope to be able to do it. Uh, uh, we have uh, got to proof of concept in the last couple of months. We're very pleased to be able to get to uh, uh, that point and are looking forward to uh, uh, building that platform as well as pipeline. Likewise, uh, you know, in the women's health front, on the one side, we built specialty capabilities on the commercial side, but we also built capabilities in the New Jersey side to do um, uh, IUDs as well as rings and, and implants. Um, and uh, uh, so, so bring brought in capabilities, brought in subject matter experts, both from a development as well as clinical standpoint, and now um, are working on a pipeline of both generic products as well as um, uh, Pfizer 5 B2s. Uh, branded products uh, on those platforms. So it's really our, uh, uh, I, I believe we are very well positioned. Um, you know, the areas that we've invested into the last many years to be able to drive sustainable growth for the generic side of, the biz uh, of our uh, business, um, you know, inhalation, biosimilars, uh, complex injectables. We are uh, already starting to see the biosimilars play out with the recent approval. Uh, we are, uh, this year is going to be an important year for us to uh, start seeing the inhalation products get approved both in the U.S. as well as uh, Europe. Um, and the next couple of years, we expect to get the complex injectables and the depot and the uh, implants approved as well. Let me ask you a slightly different attack question, more on the policy. Someone is asking, is interested in your viewpoint on how the US could provide better drug access to its citizens so that access is not based so heavily on income and how other countries manage this? That is a big question. It's a very big, <laughs> big question. And, and, and countries are very different, right? Uh, um, I mean, uh, each country, has its own policy and uh, um, um, it, its own uh, supply chain system that uh, um, you know um, uh, ensures access of um, uh, medicines to um, uh, to patients. Uh, but I'd say that um, in the U.S., there is right now a huge move uh, from the government uh, um, for more uh, U.S. manufactured products. Um, you know, as I look at uh, the industry in the U.S. over the, you know, just given uh, uh, where we are through the crisis and uh, all of the challenges the crisis has, um, um, you know, brought to the table, uh, I expect uh, that uh, a number of uh, our patients will move to uh, Medicare and Medicaid. So the government component of uh, 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 coverage is probably going to increase in the US and uh, likely making um, uh, drugs more affordable, more accessible uh, to the patients. Um, and likewise, there are companies that are working on direct to patient models, uh, especially on the digital side of our industry. We come across companies that uh, um, are looking to uh, really go direct from the plant uh, to uh, Civica as an example that I think uh, one of um, uh, the questions uh, suggested um, that are trying to really come up with an integrated model 
um, you know, and a simplified supply chain from uh, uh, the manufacturing plant to patients, uh, we will certainly see an evolution in that direction as well. And, uh, you know, we are getting, unfortunately, towards the uh, end. Let me ask you one, one question from here, and then I have a final question for you. One is, what classes or experiences at Kellogg have shaped your professional career? Ah, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I chose Kellogg, um, and that's why I was... Uh, very particular to try to get into Kellogg. I really was, like I said, it was my dream to take Lupin Global. I had always heard about Kellogg's, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, reputation on the marketing front, the international marketing. Phil Kotler was uh, there at that point in time, uh, took his class. Um, uh, Dean Jane was uh, there, uh, ran a channels class, uh, you know, a market channels class at that point in time. That was important to me. So, so uh, really international business and marketing was a real focus for me personally. Um, and Kellogg was known for it. So um, I, I was very, um, I really wanted to, um, um, uh, to benefit from um, the strength at uh, um, Kellogg. Uh, and, yeah. and uh, you know, exactly what you say, you arrived there when you were 20 years old, right? And, and uh, you, you managed to have this fantastic uh, career and really, you know, realize your dream, as you're saying, to bring the company global. But so what would you advise, advice would you give to other young people, particularly women also, right, that they are entering the force now? How can they convince people they are ready to take a challenge? Yeah, sure. And I want to say, while I was at Kellogg, uh, one of my projects, and I created a team around it, was uh, to bring Lupin to the U.S. generic market. So oh, it, I see. <laughs> it was a project that I... So it I all started on. there. <laughs> yeah, it was all part of uh, the plan. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, the advice that I would have for, I, I think it was, for me, uh, uh, a unique situation. I had, uh, while I had uh, one year experience, uh, work experience before I went to Kellogg. Um, I had really gotten into the business when I was 14 years old um, and would join my father in meetings and just observe. Um, and, uh, you know, every summer was, uh, I spent, um, um, you know, I studied pharmacy before I um, uh, worked and uh, uh, came to Kellogg. Uh, every summer when I was uh, uh, studying pharmacy, I spent in um, either our facility or other companies. I remember working in New Jersey in, in two companies uh, over two summers uh, really to uh, learn the industry. So I felt that I had been able to really gather multiple years of experience and determine exactly what I needed to be able to get where I wanted to go. And that's how I uh, determined I wanted to be at Kellogg. But, you know, uh, my advice to um, um, the, the young uh, um, students at Kellogg or folks that want to be at Kellogg is really to look inward to find your place of strength, you know, and uh, as you're venturing into new areas and are trying to really convince folks that you're ready, I mean, look back at the things that you have done uh, that have been rewarding, that uh, you've been excited about, uh, that you have excelled in, and, uh, you know, clearly there have to be many. Uh, that's why you are at Kellogg. <laughs> you know, you're part of the Kellogg network. Uh, use your the intrinsic, intrinsic points of strength as your foundation and align them to the needs of the individual or organization that you want to be part of. Um, you know, I've, I've been a firm believer that whatever your mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. I've always believed that right uh, from the beginning. Um, learned it from my father. Again, I had a, I had a terrific mentor. Uh, for the young women, I'd say uh, being a woman is empowering because the world has truly awoken to the power of inclusion and diversity. And doors are more open now than they have ever been in the past. So I say charge ahead through those doors and leave them open even wider behind you. you know? That's very inspirational. That's, <laughs> that's very, very, yeah, I hope people will listen. And by the way, I cannot, cannot um, 
resist the temptation there's another question that came in and said great talk besides a lot unfortunately i can't keep every question but i saw one it was a good maybe ending it says great talk i'm curious being a female ceo of a global family business do you manage to take vacation make personal time for yourself and your family and not let the company and family mission consume your whole life besides cooking during the covid crisis <laughs> Uh, that is a very tough balance, um, and uh, um, uh, I really have to um, uh, make time, and I, I really put in a lot of effort to make time um, for family, for friends, um, you know, and uh, uh, unfortunately vacation, which every year we would take at least one long vacation uh, during the summer when my son, 15-year-old uh, now, who doesn't want to be with us in any case, but, uh, you know, we force him to go on vacation with us. But this year we're not traveling. So we're going to be right here in Florida. And, um, um, you know, it will be a very nice combination of uh, a balance of uh, uh, work as well as uh, fun at home, um, some cooking and uh, uh, time with the family. We have a very nice uh, boat here um, on the Naples uh, Harbor, you know, waterfront. And now really I'm envious. Yeah, yeah. So th that to me was another stress buster every weekend uh, while, um, you know, um, I had uh, multiple of my family members that were locked into their buildings and uh, we were able to go out on, on the boat and, uh, you know, uh, get a break. So um, I feel like I'm blessed uh, to have uh, this balance built into where I am right now in uh, Naples, Florida, and will make the most of it. Well, I'm sure. Well, I, I'm, I'm afraid we have got to the end, which is a pity, as I'm saying, I have to leave so many questions unanswered. Maybe I'll send you the questions, but, uh, but it's been a, such a pleasure. Um, and I can see from the question, everybody appreciate it so much to hear your, uh, I have to say, this has reminded me as last time I met you. And there's so much passion when you talk about uh, the business and uh, and uh, how you see it going there's so much passion in you and it's uh, and such a great vision so it's really inspiring so thank you finita thank you for uh, joining us today it's been amazing thank you thank you so much francesca for having me i'll be i'll be very happy to uh, answer the questions uh, via email uh, but uh, i really enjoyed uh, uh, talking to you and uh, hopefully i've been able to answer most of the questions that uh, the Keller community had. Oh, definitely, definitely. I think it's uh, we'll get maybe a burst of all people wanting to enter in the pharma industry, inspired by you. We, we need more. We need more people to join uh, join the fight. Good. <laughs> You're right. Thank you so much. Bye, bye, everybody. Thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you.